second James Bond thriller could be more exciting than the first. Upon its release in 1962, Dr. No became an immediate box office hit, grossing nearly $60 million in its theatrical run. Audiences were transported to a fantasy setting the likes of which they'd never seen, taking a glimpse into the world of James Bond, the characters who inhabited it, and all the crazy spy hijinks in between. Naturally, Bond producers Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman were keen to produce another Bond film, and planned to bring all the major players back to the fold. Sean Connery would return once again as the double-O agent with a license to kill, and even Dr. No director Terence Young was recommissioned to direct the film, along with the rest of his crew, in what would become From Russia With Love. Despite high expectations for the film and numerous setbacks during production, the film released to a fever pitch in 1963, and would cement James Bond's status as a worldwide phenomenon. James Bond, that notorious, amazing Dr. No secret agent is back and half the world is out to kill him as he pits his murderous talents against the Iron Curtain and its velvet women. Well, I'll tell you something, Coltoni. You're one of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. I think my mouth is too big. No, it's the right size. For me, that is. From Russia With Love is widely regarded as one of the best Bond films, and in my opinion, it's a possible candidate for being one of the best spy films ever made. You don't have to take my word for it. U.S. President John F. Kennedy himself listed the novel as one of his top ten favorites of all time. I mean, damn, that's a hell of an endorsement. It deviates from the tropical fantasy setting of Jamaica from the previous film, and focuses on a more realistic premise in Istanbul, set in the then-current Cold War era, a time period which future Bond films would follow more closely. This was also the first film which would establish many conventions that would become commonplace in Bond films over the years, including secret gadgets, more frequent and stylized action sequences, and the use of a theme with lyrics. The Under the Mango Tree song from Dr. No doesn't count. Mm. Souvenir from another jealous woman? Yes, but I haven't turned my back on one since. Mm -hmm. It was also the first film in the series to make use of an opening pre-title sequence, and a pretty creative one at that. It shows Bond navigating his way through a garden at night, who looks unusually nervous while he's being stalked by an assassin in the dark. He's eventually caught and killed by the assassin, only to reveal that the pursuit was a Spectre training exercise, with Bond turning out to be a regular Joe wearing a Bond mask. Imagine how pissed off a theater audience would have been in 1963, eagerly waiting to see Bond on screen again, only to see him get killed off. That would have been hilarious. Anyway, the opening scene is great. It sets up the tone for the rest of the film, and it's followed by an amazing orchestration of the Bond theme. God, does that kick ass or what? The main plot of the film follows Bond being recruited for an escort mission. He's tasked in assisting with the defection of a Soviet consulate clerk and making sure she escapes unscathed. MI6 is offered a top secret intelligence device called the Lecter in exchange for their cooperation, and Bond decides that the mission is worth the risk, if only to retrieve the Lecter and gain an upper hand against the Soviets. Well, really, I'm not too busy at the moment, sir. You're booked on the 8.30 plate in the morning. If there's any chance of us getting a lector, we simply must look into it. Suppose when she meets me in the flesh, uh, I don't come up to expectations. Just see what you do. However, Spectre is hot on Bond's trail at the same time, seeking revenge for the death of Dr. No. They plan to use him as a middleman in retrieving the lector device before killing him and taking it back to retrieve the intelligence inside it before selling it back to the Soviets for a huge ransom. The whole film is basically a two hour long cat and mouse scenario, which could get tiring, but fortunately, that isn't the case for this film. With the exception of Connery's Bond and a few select staff at MI6, the film is stacked with a variety of new characters. I'll start with the good guys first. Tatiana Romanova is probably the most notable, being the second Bond girl in the franchise and played by Daniela Bianchi. She's recruited by one of the film's villains, a Spectre operative who's in disguise as an agent with Smirsch. She's ordered under the threat of death to keep tabs on James Bond and obey anything he asks of her. 
Corporal, I have selected you for a most important assignment. Its purpose is to give false information to the enemy. If you complete it successfully, you will be promoted. From now on, you will do anything he says. And if I refuse? Then you will not leave this room alive. This dynamic creates some tension between the two characters that adds to the already tense atmosphere brought about by the chase for the Lecter, as well as the Cold War in general. While I wouldn't say she's as memorable as Honey Rider in terms of personality, she at least plays an important role in the story from the beginning, and it's interesting to see how she becomes torn between serving for her Soviet homeland and the British government over the course of the film's events. Also, and this is kind of unrelated, but I like how she says Bond's name. I know she's supposed to be Russian and has an accent, but it sounds like gems. And I have nothing to wear. Huh? Your trousseau. Oh, gems. Huh? One moment. Oh, oh no. Gems, gems. Another notable addition to the cast is Desmond Llewellyn, a longtime mainstay in the Bond cast who would portray the role of Q for more than three decades, though technically in this film he's still credited as Boothroyd. Naturally, we also get to see him introduce his first ever Bond gadget in the form of a fold-up rifle and a tear gas suitcase. Now normally to open a case like that, you move the catches to the side. If you do, the cartridge will explode in your face. Now, to stop the cartridge exploding, turn the catches horizontally, like that. Then, open normally. Now you try it. Mm. Turn the catches like that. That's right. And open ordinarily. You got it? Yes, I think so. It's weird to see Q interact with Bond in such a positive, or at least neutral, manner compared to the antagonistic relationship we'd see between the two later on. Finally, there's Ali Karambe, portrayed by Pedro Armendariz, and I gotta say, I love this guy. He plays a key role in the film's events, heading the MI6 station in Istanbul to assist with Bond's mission. Even though he doesn't look like a combatant, he gets caught up in some of the most memorable action scenes in the film, and he can even hold his own in a gunfight. He also has some of the funniest dialogue in the film. One scene in the film features Karim trying to read a newspaper in peace, and his mistress keeps badgering him to have sex with her. You are not glad to see me this morning, Serene? Overjoyed. I no longer please you. Be still. Back to the salt mines. He's also notable for employing the services of his many sons. So I gathered from your chauffeur. He's a rather intelligent young man, by the way. He should be. He's my son. Coffee? Medium sweet. Two medium sweet. He also is my son. All of my key employees are my sons. I like big families myself. In fact, my whole life has been a crusade for larger families. So I heard. To be honest, Karen Bay is probably one of my favorite side characters in the entire franchise. He's funny and likable, while managing to be helpful in aiding Bond's mission to smuggle the Lecter out of the Soviet consulate. Unfortunately, Armandaras was diagnosed with cancer during filming, and his scenes had to be rushed to completion before he was eventually admitted to a hospital. Following completion of his scenes, he smuggled a pistol into his hospital room and committed suicide at the age of 51. Even though he performed the majority of his scenes in great pain, he was able to see his role to completion, a true testament to his talent forever immortalized in film history. I've had a particularly fascinating life. Would you like to hear about it? Mm. You would. The villains have their share of the spotlight as well, including the first on-screen appearance of the head of Spectre, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. Sort of. At the time, the character's identity was enshrouded in mystery. His face was obscured from the camera at all times, and he only goes by the code name number one. Even in the ending credits, his name was left out, being replaced with a question mark. Just listening to his voice alone, you can tell he means business, though it's a little offset by the cat in his lap. Our rules are very simple. 
If you fail. Twelve seconds. One day we must invent a faster working venom. There's also Rosa Klebb, the ex smirsh operative played by Lottie Lenya. She's more of a behind the scenes villain and directs other characters to do her bidding, but she's no stranger to occasional conflict either, coming equipped with poison tipped daggers concealed in her shoes. She's also notable for a particular scene where she suggestively demonstrates sexual interest toward a character of the same gender. Her actions aren't really addressed again outside of this one scene, so sadly there's not much development as far as this part of her personality is concerned, but at the time, it was ambitious to show even something as tame as one woman stroking another's neck. She even goes so far as to be kind and caring while doing so, which I always thought was funny considering how Kleb's personality switches at the drop of a hat. I see you trained for the ballet. But I grew an inch over the regulation height, and so? And then you have had the three lovers. What is the purpose of such an intimate question? You are not here to ask questions. You forget to whom you're speaking. But the main villain is this guy, Red Grant, played by Robert Shaw, who's probably best known for his role as Quint in the Spielberg blockbuster Jaws. He's hired by Spectre near the beginning of the film to follow Bond and make sure he stays on track to retrieve the lector. He even goes so far as to protect him from incoming danger when he isn't looking. It's a brilliant idea that's executed amazingly, and it gets even better when Grant finally confronts Bond on the train. At first, he pretends to be an MI6 liaison escorting Bond back to London with Lecter, but breaks his cover due to his lack of wine knowledge. Oui, monsieur. I'll have a bottle of the Blanc du Blanc. Oui, monsieur. Make mine, Chianti. White Chianti, monsieur? Uh, no, the red kind. Well, enjoy your dinner, old man. I think I've got the answer to our problems. Very simple, really. Good. For some reason, that scene reminds me of Inglorious Bastards when Lieutenant Hickox uses the wrong hand gesture to order beer. The scene which follows is probably my favorite scene in all of Connery's Bond films. Unlike Dr. No, where Bond's hand is forced by being outnumbered and outgunned, here, Bond is forced into a tight spot by one man who is always two steps ahead of him. Even when confronted by Bond over the wine mishap, Grant still manages to convince Bond that he's working on behalf of MI6. He then knocks out Bond when he isn't looking, and holds him up when he regains consciousness. In this moment, Bond has been bested by an unknown adversary, and he needs to use his wits to escape the situation, all while Grant continually taunts him at gunpoint. Red wine with fish. Well, that should have told me something. You may know the right wines. The other one on your knees. How does it feel, old man? Old man? Is that what you chaps and Smirsh call each other? Smirsh? Of course, Spectre. One of the main reasons I love this film so much is how seamlessly it blurs the line between fantasy and realism. It relies on a Cold War setting, but doesn't play up the opposing forces so much as uses them as a backdrop for the film's events. At its core, it's still very much a spy film, where Bond has to go around looking for clues to go about completing his objective. But even though he has assistance from multiple characters, they're all in the dark and trying to figure things out as much as he is. This leads to an increased sense of urgency, as Bond tries to find out as much information as he can about what he's dealing with, all while simultaneously escorting Tatiana to safety. And just when they think they're safe and have it all figured out, Spectre throws a curveball in the form of Grant. It's this juxtaposition between a simple premise and a complex series of events that makes the film work so well. It starts with a straightforward objective, and the plot starts to unravel and reveal all of its layers, one piece at a time. No matter what Bond does, Spectre is always watching him and reacting to his every move, and it makes for great thriller cinema. How much are they paying you? What's it to you? We'll double it. Your word of honor? As an English gentleman? Hmm. The first one won't kill you. Not the second. Not even the third. Not till you crawl over here and you kiss my foot. 
Speaking of thrills, a Bond film wouldn't be complete without its fair share of action scenes, and this is definitely a step up from Dr. No. There are still a few classic sleuthing scenes, like when Bond arrives at a hotel and searches for bugs in his room, but it's fair to say that the success of Dr. No allowed for a little more wiggle room as far as budget was concerned. The shootout at the gypsy camp is a big highlight for me. Stuff gets lit on fire, people are shot all over the place, it's all good fun. There's even a cat fight thrown in for good measure. The best part by far is when Bond is cornered by boats manned by Spectre goons and he explodes the fuel barrels in the water. Apparently the explosion was so big it singed the eyelids of one of the actors. And of course, no set piece is complete without a good old fashioned one liner. There's a saying in England, where there's smoke there's fire. I also have to give major props to the soundtrack, which is the first one in the series to be composed by John Barry though technically he was involved in recomposing the Bond theme originally written by Monty Norman in Dr. No. The music perfectly accentuates the mood of any scene Bond is in, be it a slow, nail-biting stealth sequence, or fast-paced action-charged instances with the alternate 007 theme. The From Russia With Love theme performed by Matt Monroe is also a classic Bond theme composition that would go on to establish the standard for future themes to follow. It plays at the first and last scenes of the film, so it makes for good thematic bookends to contain the main story within. But if you blink, you might miss it in the beginning, as it can only be heard on a radio in the background while Bond is busy doing what he does best. To be honest, there's not much I can find to complain about in this film. There are a few annoyances that carry over from Dr. No. Some jump cuts are still there where they shouldn't be, the story's still a little slow in the beginning, and Peter Hunt still really loves throwing in the Bond theme. Uh, James Bond, your reservation for Ah, Mr. Bond, your room is ready. Number 32. 32 for Mr. Bond. Hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you. One scene that does bother me is where Bond slaps Tatiana on the train trying to interrogate her. I understand he's a 007 agent and he can't ever fully trust anyone, but this comes just a few minutes after he playfully spanks her in the rear, so the tonal shift is really jarring, not to mention dated as far as overall norms go. I think the main problem with this film is that the plot takes a while to digest. It isn't as straightforward as Dr. No where Bond just has to find a missing person. Here, Bond has to escort a clerk with valuable intel, seduces her despite the fact she's a Soviet who believes in her country's values, having to avoid being caught by Soviets and Spectre at the same time. There's so many variables here, one could be forgiven for losing track of the story in their first viewing. But at least the increase in action set pieces make up for it, and it's a miracle the film came out as well as it did, considering the problems that happened during the making of it. Reshoots put the film behind schedule and over budget, and serious accidents occurred during filming that hampered production, including one that almost claimed the life of director Terence Young. This thing took off, and it went backwards. The helicopter took off, took over into the water, rose about 30, 40 feet, and suddenly didn't rise anymore. Stood still for a moment. Terence is waving to us, and I knew they are going to have a problem. The pilot had the presence of, presence of mind to put the helicopter into a 90-degree angle. Uh, and then he flipped it on its side, and it went straight into the sea. Terence Young and the designer were 
taken ashore. Terence was slightly bleeding on his legs, but he didn't even worry about this. Terence said, let's get back to the unit straight away. He just turned around to us and said, right, I'll give you the next shot. Terence got behind the camera again, didn't say a word to anybody. And we were shooting within 35 minutes. We shot all day long, like nothing had ever happened. It was it's quite amazing, absolutely amazing. Even with the struggles that the cast and crew endured throughout, From Russia With Love released to enormous critical and commercial success, and rightfully so. To this day, I think it stands as a prime example of how to make a spy film. It injects a dose of realism into the story infused with real-life tension brought about by the Cold War, but not so much that dulls the film's sense of fun. It knows when to take itself seriously, and when to cut loose and have a blast. If this film took itself seriously the whole time, I don't think it would have had the same appeal. There's still room for jokes here and there, and of course the ramp up in action is a welcome addition. Dr. No had established the foundation for the franchise, and From Russia With Love built upon it to create the Bond formula as we know it, as well as cementing James Bond's status as the greatest secret agent in film history. Although, one person might take issue with that statement. Who is Bond compared with Kronstein? Exactly. Bottom line, if you haven't seen this film, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's definitely one I'd recommend to anyone who earnestly loves watching movies. It's not only a great Bond film, but a great film in its own right. This concludes my review of From Russia With Love. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and stay tuned for the next one. You haunted me so.